our second talk. Um, the talk will be People Patterns by Joe O'Brien. So please welcome Joe to the stage. So we made a comment in the last talk about uh, scaring you with a bunch of uh, code and things. So I'm actually here to scare the hell out of you because I'm going to talk to a bunch of introverts about people. So uh, this should be fun. Um, about four or five years ago, maybe, um, we were, I was just talking to Andy earlier, we couldn't figure out exactly what it was. I was down in Raleigh, North Carolina, and um, got to hear Andy give his talk, um, uh, Pragmatic Thinking and Learning and Refactoring the Wetware. And at the time, he claimed not to be writing a book. I'm so thankful he did. Um, and um, where he basically took brain learning, brain science, a lot of stuff that had been written, and distilled it out for geeks. And so he came up with a guide to the brain for geeks. Um, one of the best books out there that I've read that really helped a lot of teams, a lot of people I know. So this is not a suggestion, this is a command. You have to go out and uh, buy this book. And just to let you know, I'm not doing this because Andy's actually here. I've done this in every talk I've this year. I figured out a way to wind it in. But in, doing, in reading this book, it really inspired me to start looking and thinking about, uh, that just went out. Is this a range problem? Probably. It'll come back. Yeah, it's Testing the edge cases. It goes in and out all the so, time. Um, um, but I've been taking um, what I've learned over the years about people and trying to apply it to a way that people with the geeks would understand. Because I've come from a sales background. Um, I've had an inner geek for a long time that I kept trying to run away from. It finally caught up with me. Um, but my first couple technical interviews, they started talking to my feet. They started showing me cubicles back in the back, buried behind boxes where people really weren't there that I would be working in. I'd get excited when I saw a phone, and they're like, yeah, but that never goes off. Um, I'm kind of that weird geek where I need to be around people. I need to talk to people. Um, but this has also gotten me where I am and has helped me move forward, which is great for me personally. Then about seven years ago, I started with a company called ThoughtWorks. And it was fascinating for me because I got in there thinking I'm going to learn all this technical stuff. It's going to be fantastic. The best thing I learned there and the lessons I continually learned while I was there were people-based. How to deal with teams, how to deal with people when you're pairing all the time, when you're really in agile environments, it's a pressure cooker scenario, things boil up to the top. When you go and try to hire the smartest people you possibly can, you run into a lot of personality conflicts. So how do you deal with those? What happens? What are things you have that you can, tools at your disposal? And they're great, but nobody's really written a lot of these, well, people have written these down for, for decades, for centuries, um, but nobody's really written them down for geeks. So what I'm trying to do here is called people patterns. Namings of some of them are still rough. This is all still in draft form, but, um, really starts getting, uh, getting you to a place where you can understand them. And the other thing I'm trying to do is really test Kobe's patience as far as the camera's concerned. So we'll see how well he keeps up with that. Um, the first one I'm going to tell you is people are interesting. I saw somebody tweet about coming to this conference. And it was something to the effect of, I'm coming to a strange city, traveling out of my comfort zone, going to be by myself. This should be interesting. Some paraphrased, of course, and probably um, poetically licensed there. But, the idea was funny to me because I've never been more comfortable than when I go to a geek conference. It doesn't matter how many people I don't know there, I'm going to a room full of people who all have the same interests that I do. I can strike up a conversation with any random person there and know that we have a lot in common already. And so to me, it's incredibly comforting. Take me to the airport, it's a much different scenario. right? You're going to be with just as many people around you at times but it's, you can't just strike up a conversation with random people and expect to have something in common. So people are interesting. If you're at a technical conference, like you are now, especially if you go to one in a different city, don't take the time between to hack on something. Don't take the time afterwards to sit down with a bunch of laptops. Sit down and start talking to people. One of my favorite trends in the Ruby community for a while was the fact that they would play werewolf. Because you'd get into a room and you would play a game, which every kid loves a game, right? But it required you to actually talk to people. I know, really scary. But um, it was a lot of fun. What this does is give you practice at your craft. Nobody likes to admit it, but people are an essential part of what you do in a day-to-day -day life. I don't care if you're agile or not. I don't care what happens. Getting to know personality types is one of those critical things you can do. So Andy and Dave tell you to learn a new programming language every year. This year, do not. Take the time you would dedicate to a new programming language. Start off by reading Pragmatic Thinking and Learning. Go out and get another book, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. 
It's a lot less cynical than the title says. I actually think the title is poorly named in some regards. But go out and practice working with people. Practice talking to them. Take some of the things I'm going to tell you here today and try to implement them. Because it's going to tell you how to get better ahead in your job. It's going to tell you how to get better along with, sometimes get along with your spouse. Now, as soon as I figure that out, I'll let you know, but you know, I'm still working on that. But it's going to really enable your career to be what it is. Because what do we do? We like to think that we sling code, but not really. And if I try to grab somebody else's drink, please let me know. <laughs> what we actually try to do is develop things. We create things for who? For people. Sometimes it's one computer to another, but there's a business reason that it's there. Your boss might be the biggest jerk in the world if you look at him through your eyes. What about looking at him through his eyes? So when you have a conversation, the next pattern is listen without agenda. I have a real problem with this. I have a lot of exciting things that I've done that I love to tell people about. It's not an arrogance thing. I've met a lot of amazing people. It's not a name dropping problem. It's just a problem I have in my brain. I want to share these things with you because I think they're cool. Just like when I first discovered Ruby, I kept going to my wife going, look, this is so neat. She'd go, what the hell? Right? She had no idea. She's not technical. So I started a Ruby user group just so I could get people in the same room so I could go, look, isn't this cool? Right? But I get excited about this. But what ends up happening is I'll have conversations with people occasionally and they'll say something and my brain goes, oh man, I want to tell that story and it starts playing in my head. And so I start listening to, their, listening to what they're saying, thinking, what can I say? What can I contribute? But doing that will kill a conversation. And it'll kill the interesting things you discover about somebody. So don't have a conversation in order to get your point across. Have a conversation and ask questions in order to hear what they're saying. And listen without agenda. Which brings up another interesting pattern, which I've called the three realities. This came from two sources. One from a book by Scott Berglund, um, Confessions of a Public Speaker, which if you've, even if you've never, never spoken before, for some reason I've got way more adrenaline than usual. <laughs> so, like shaking is kind of weird. Um, where he talks about giving a talk. And he gave a 10 minute talk at, I think it was Web 2.0, some large O'Reilly stage, he was there. He had exactly 10 minutes to give this talk. So he rehearsed it. He rehearsed it again, he rehearsed it again. Got it down to exactly nine minutes and 57 seconds. It's perfect. So he gets up onto the stage, there's a timer there, and the guy introduces him. He's like, you know, gives his history, and ladies and gentlemen, Scott Berlin, thank you very much. He starts walking up to the stage, and he turns around the remote, and there's a timer in front of him, and it says nine minutes and 40 seconds. He goes, oh God, I didn't take into account walking. I didn't take into account. He starts giving his first line, and people applaud and, and, and laugh. And then he starts speaking, and he goes, oh god, I didn't take into account timing of applause. Oh my god, what am I going to do? Oh my god, I'm behind now. So then he starts rushing, and then he gets ahead. Oh my god, what am I going to do now? And then he gets a little bit behind, and he steps off stage, he's sweating, he's like, oh my god, it's the worst talk I've ever given. A couple minutes later, somebody comes up to him and shakes his hand, and goes, that was one of the best talks I've ever seen, and gives a personal reason behind it. They're all excited. And he's looking at this person going, how can this be the best talk you've ever, you've got to be kidding me, right? But it really spoke to them, and he steps back. And he didn't really say it, but another story from that week had come in and where I was sitting in with a counselor with my wife and I. And we were having a lot of problems and discussions about a certain thing, and there was a one particular event we were arguing about, and it was absolutely comical how far off we were viewing this. And it took me back to when studying political science, I took a comparative political, or uh, it was basically political ideologies. And our test at the very end was one statement. Hillary Rodham Clinton proposes health care. And you had to state what the historical context of that was from four different points of view. And it's amazing how one sentence and one event can be described from very different views. My wife and I are looking at one particular fight we had had and we're talking about it. And we were so far off it was comical. She was mad about me because of something completely else. I assume she was mad about me about completely something else. So there are always three realities. One one person sees, one the other person sees, and then there's that one in the middle that's actually the events that occurred. And so Scott talks about it in his book, he says, you know what, it wasn't the worst talk I'd ever given. I was nervous, I was terrible because of my timing, but the actual reality was not that it was the best talk I'd ever given. 
But that person I connected with on a certain level, they heard something they wanted to hear. So to them, it was the most amazing thing in the world. But the reality was somewhere in between. <laughs> so if you're nervous to get up on a stage and you stand up and give a talk and you walk off and go, oh my god, that was so terrible. It really wasn't. It was it the best event you ever had? Probably not. But it probably wasn't the worst either. Next pattern. Tell bad news quickly. Bad news, like stress, like anything else, some bad event that you've got to relate to somebody, is an acid that will eat your brain alive. It will eat your body away. It'll take you as far as wanting to throw up and not being able to eat a meal. It will have physical ramifications. It will have mental ramifications. Because it's a weight you're carrying. It's a secret. I would be terrible at military intelligence, just to let you know. <coughs> not for the intelligence part. No jokes there. <laughs> I can't keep secrets. I can't keep these things in me. They, they eat away, especially if it's bad news. So you have something that's happened. A project's going to get canceled. Or, no, better yet, you've discovered a technical problem on your, on your project that's going to delay this thing. It's inevitable. You've discovered a technical smell you get, or a new, a new part of the technology you didn't think of before. You're in consulting and somebody's paying you to build this. You're in a big company and there's a budget on the way and you want to get a promotion after this is done. Whatever it may be. You've discovered something that has to be told. It's going to start eating at you. The longer you let it eat at you, the worse shape you're going to be in. Number two, the per people you're talking to are more concerned about you hiding that than they are about the bad news itself. I don't care who the person is. I don't care how much of a prick this person is that you work for. They're more concerned about your reactions to something than they are about the news itself. I guarantee you. It happened 100% of the time for me. And I've seen it happen to people over and over again. The faster you relay the information, the better. Now, that, uh, yeah, so that'll lead into another part, which is, um, so these are going to kind of intertwine, but the next one's brutal honesty. And it's a terrible naming for it. I want to work on that. But the other part of it is, it is, if it is bad news, don't sugarcoat it. Because sugarcoating it and waiting says two things. It says you're trying to be deceitful. It says you're trying to know more than you do. By hiding something, you're sending a signal that, um, that they can't trust you when things go wrong. Your job as a developer, and especially a manager's job, quote unquote traditional manager, is to react to these things and to adjust. If you're in an Agile environment, the reason you're doing Agile is because you want to find out the bad news as fast as possible. It's the very simplest part, the most distilled version of Agile you'll ever hear. It's measured feedback, whether on small scale or large scale. It's the entire existence of the Agile development nature. So you want to know bad news as quickly as possible. Get it out there. Get it in front of people. Understand what is wrong. Bring it to somebody. Here's what we discovered. Here's what's happening. Here are the things that I'm doing right now to try to measure this and figure it out more. I'll update you again at X time. And then please God, update him at X time because that's even worse. But get it out there. It's going to eat at you. Their reaction is always going to be way less than you think it is. The brutal honesty, don't sugarcoat it. Because if you try to, again, you're trying to hide something. And brutal honesty is bad because brutal says you're really not paying attention to somebody's feelings. But if you're in a team environment, an agile environment, giving positive feedback when it's really not deserved is not benefiting somebody. Now, a lot of people here from the Midwest, I come from Ohio, we consider ourselves the Midwest too, we can fight it out later. But, <laughs> but um, we tend to be really, really polite. So somebody would come up to me after one of my talks, oh my god, that was a wonderful talk, thank you so much. And that's really appreciated. But there are times people feel like they have to say that. And that's not. It's not that I'm unappreciative, okay? That doesn't help. Especially if there's something I did wrong. So I've got certain friends of mine who are speakers, and every time I talk to them, I always tell them, if you watch me give a talk, give me feedback, please. You're not going to hurt my feelings. You should have done this. You should pace less. Anything like that, right? I'm going to take it. I know how to digest feedback. I'm going to go, yeah, I would love to pace less if you can figure out how to get rid of energy while I'm on stage. I will, but for now, suck it up. <laughs> but I know how to deal with this. 
I've got a thick enough skin, but I'm never going to improve if I don't hear the negatives. So if you're in a team environment, absolute honesty is much better than sugar-coated goodness. Always is, every time. This goes back to the three realities thing, but the next one is, what do they see? I was in a meeting one time, and all of us at Educase have gotten to know our own personalities really well, some, in some ways thanks to uh, Andy's book. Been diagnosed with ADD, not a surprise to anybody really. Um, but I know how my brain works, and I know certain things and tricks I need to keep myself going. We have meetings at Educase, and hardly anybody will look up from their laptop. Some people will play with toys. Some people sit there and stare at and try to concentrate on what's going on. Everybody knows what they need to do to get the most out of the meeting and the, the discussion we're having, right? But we know that. Take you back two months ago, I sat in a meeting. We had a client there. I had three developers and myself. I was absolutely disgusted because one developer was looking at the client the entire meeting. Now the other ones were contributing. They weren't off playing solitaire on their laptops, right? But they were listening and they digested every bit of what was said, but the client didn't know that. The client was up there thinking that the entire room is not, does not give a rip about what's going on. So everybody's so concerned about their own brain and about digesting that they don't think, what is the impression I'm giving off? There are times, like right now, Yesterday, I traveled from Tokyo all the way here. I'm extremely exhausted. And if I came up here and was like, yeah, so there's this other thing, right? It might be what my body wants to do, but does that give you guys the impression that I really want to be here? That I'm really having fun, that I'm, that I'm excited about it? Yes, part of it's the energy surge of adrenaline. But realistically, um, thank you, I've got one up front too. Appreciate that. Um, um, Realistically, I need to take in, what are people looking at me? What are, what are people seeing that I'm giving off? If I'm having a conversation with my wife and she's really excited about something, the last thing I need to do is go, uh-huh. That's gonna piss her off faster than anything. But you know what, it would be too. Because yes, she wants to roll her eyes as soon as I say anything tactical, but if I say it like this, she just knows, okay, just humor him, <laughs> right? Pay attention to what they see, physically see. Pay attention to what you're giving off. Yes, this is a recipe to create the most self-conscious people you've ever met in your life. Again, I'll figure out how to deal with that one, I know, but um, it still plays into my head when I'm talking to people. Again, part of the problem with ADD is you think on many levels all at once. You can't sort and, and prioritize information as it comes in. So you have tricks and things that go on. Part of it is like having a multi-threaded brain, okay? Of course, go read Andy's book, you'll know that you really do. Um, but I need to ad ad adjust to the fact that I'm always running on two different threads. When I'm speaking, I have one coming out. I've got another one going, okay, what's coming next? How's my pace going? How are the reactions around the room? Are people going, mm -hmm. are people like, oh God, I'm falling asleep? Are people laughing? Thank God, right? But I need to know what, um, what it is that I'm projecting when those threads are going on. And so a lot of times when we talk to somebody, I'll think of something happened to me earlier, talking to somebody, I really wanted to know a story he would, this guy was telling me I had to stop him and I felt really bad, so he was Marty, because I was like, it occurred to me I needed index cards. I hadn't gotten them yet. <laughs> and it just, you know, it stops and I'm, and I'm trying to concentrate. So understand what it is you're giving out. Understand what people are seeing. It will go a long way to helping you in your communication. Because if they see these negative things, if your boss sees this boredom, it's amazing what happens. I was in a uh, company that we helped they called us for a Rails 911. They'd gotten to the inevitable, they'd gotten to the 10 yard line, which is really close to scoring points for all you that don't know anything about sports. <laughs> <laughs> I always need to remember to put that in there. But we had gotten really close and they just couldn't get the last little bit done. So I walk in there and we start talking. Within three minutes of the meeting, I can see exactly what's going on. The developer hates the boss, the boss hates the developer. Oh, this should be fun. The boss is sitting there, everybody in the office is pretty dressed up. It's a startup. But everybody there, you know, yeah, pretty nice business casual. Developer comes walking in, he hasn't shaven in about, I don't know, three and a half years. <laughs> um, has his Birkenstocks on, shorts that are ripped, comes strolling in about 9.30, carrying his laptop, looking like he's just gotten high. He probably just hasn't slept, but you know, impressions are impressions. 
And we sit down in this meeting, and you can instantly see the boss like tense up because he's five or ten minutes late. Now, I knew the guy. I actually recommended him in this job. I've known Gary for a long time, and I can guarantee you he was up till two or three in the morning working on the problem that was going on right then. Well, what's the impression he's giving off? Now, is it the boss's job to understand that as well? Yeah, probably. Can you control that? No. You can control you. Okay? Am I saying you always have to dress up or come in early? No. But understand that for some people, this is what they see. This is what they take in. This is the impression of the problem they're getting from you. How much you care, how much you don't care. Do I have a magical answer on how to get over that? No. But if you understand it, you know, knowledge is power, right? If you understand it, you can start correcting for it, or you can start compensating for it, or you can start communicating. It's part of the brutal honesty. Tell them what's going on. Look, I don't get up early. I never have. Some people that have worked in a bank for 10, 15 years get a great idea and come out and start a startup, which I've seen happen time and time again, have never experienced what it's like to get real work done but between the hours of 10 and midnight, to get real work done from a coffee shop, to get just as excited about somebody else, but there's no physical way for them to get their butt out of bed at 10.30 in the morning. It just doesn't happen, right? Some people don't understand that. Just because you had a very lucky person or lucky time streak, you know, something that works really well for you, does that mean you should start getting in earlier? Not necessarily. Because if your energy levels are not up there in the mornings, it's a bad thing. <coughs> now, should you go into consulting for the enterprise? God, no. <laughs> but maybe you should sit down and have a brutally honest conversation with your boss that says, look, I can't do this. I never have. Here's my entire history out, laid out. Here's what I've done in my life, and here's how this works. The brutal honesty can go back to what do they see. Because I have stopped conversations with people and said, you know what? It looks like you're really pissed at me. What happened? What did I do? Now, that's really hard for some people to hear, OK? Granted, it's not an easy conversation to hear or anything, because it does put somebody back on their heels. So be sure to present it in a nice way. You know, don't, what the hell did I do? You just look pissed, right? But just, look, I'm detecting something. Did I make a mistake? <clears throat> Good friend, really close friend of mine, has this eternally kind of tired and ticked off look. And he's usually just thinking. But every now and then, it does keep bothering me. I can't continue the conversation because I'm constantly thinking, OK, I really pissed him off, but I'm not sure at what point I did. And so I will stop him. And he's like, oh, God, no, no, no. Um, actually, sorry, I was not paying attention to that part. I was just pissed at my girlfriend because of the, right? And you can keep going on with the conversation. But you can make sure that information is getting across. Now, again, I don't do this with a client that understands. But in a team setting, it's again, what, this thought, what ThoughtWorks taught me really well is you're in a small environment, small, agile team, with a lot of pressures around you, you're traveling a lot, you've got a lot of things going on, that is the definition of a pressure cooker. Little things build up very quickly, so you can get rid of them quickly. You have those conversations. Don't hesitate to. You're all there trying to get something done. If something's bothering them, it's eating at them as well. Very quickly, <coughs> talk to them then or take them out in the hallway. Hey, let's go get a coffee. As soon as you get out, okay, dude, this is what I'm seeing, what did I do? Right? Listen between the lines. This one's really tricky. Everybody went to school at some point. Well, okay, some of us longer than others. For those, I got kicked out. But um, while we were in school, at some point we probably read a story about a guy going around chasing a white whale with a big stick, right? Some people read a book that talked all about life and what it meant and the beginning and the pursuit to the end. But they kept talking about this damn whale with it, too, and I couldn't figure that part out. You study American literature, there's always two parts. OK, any literature. There's usually two things that are going on. There's the actual story, and there's what the point of what they're trying to get across. Animal Farm is not a story about a bunch of farm animals. <laughs> I know, amazing, isn't it? When people ask questions, there's usually something underneath them. Um, just two days ago, God, believe it or not, I'm sitting in Tokyo giving a talk at a conference on Agile. And the guy talks and he's like, so, when you're doing this Agile thing, and you're going along, how do you deal with the fact that 
you know, all of a sudden something changes, and uh, now you need to get a release out, you know, a, a little faster, or you know, um, a new a new priorities come out, and uh, now you really need to to buckle down and get something done. How do you get back on the agile train after that's done? I can answer the question, or I can go. What I hear is that you don't work hard enough during Agile sprints. And so there's times you have to actually get some real work done and then get back to this nice, easy lifestyle. Right? Now, I'm dramatically paraphrasing what he said because you know, I want to make a point. So I can do that. I have a microphone. But when people ask questions, why are they asking that question? A customer recently asked us a question about what we were doing and how we were billing, or actually what we were doing project management-wise. But all I could hear is, I don't understand the billing model still. We've been with them for three or four months. We don't sell by hour, we sell by iteration. We sell two, there it goes again. Okay, is it back? Okay, that's just weird. Um, we sell two people in part-time project management for two weeks at a fixed price, and we teach you how we're gonna work, and we, work, we focus on working together not with you, not for you. But at some point, they, at some point, he missed what we were doing, and he missed the point of what we were doing. He's asking this question. I could very easily answer his question, or I could say, wait a minute, something's uneasy about that. So when people ask questions, try to listen between lines. Listen to what they're actually asking. And the last one I'm going to leave you on, because I'm going to leave you on a high note, is one I've tried to get across to my business partner for five years now, and I still struggle with this to this day, because he's the world's most pessimistic individual, individual I've ever met. Assume positives. We are one of the most cynical crowds I've ever met in my life. This is also the smartest group of people I've ever met in my life. Developers are constantly questioning rules, which is great, because nine times out of 10, they are smarter than the person sitting next to them, which is a recipe for disaster when it comes to people, let me tell you. But the one thing we always do is we know in our heads what the worst possible outcome of something could be, so we automatically cycle there. And hardly ever have I seen a developer get be correct. Oh, this guy's trying to do this because he can make a lot of money off of it, and ah, he's going to go run out, and he wants to buy a jet, and he's just using me as a slave. Really? It's easy to assume the negative. Why? Because we hate to be let down. Again, go read Andy's book. There's psychological reasons for it, but we hate to be let down. So if we put a guard up, and somebody comes and surprises us and is good, fantastic. But if we put up a guard and they meet that guard and it's a negative scenario, well, I was justified. And just like the lottery and slots, the one time you were burned in your life is going to cause you to be negative for the rest of your life. Because it happened once, but it's going to happen again. It's the same psychological thing that makes people pump quarters into slot machines quite often. Assume positives. Assumption of negative. Assumption of another agenda, assumption of something else, can kill the ability to listen to what they're saying, to sit there and look at their perspective, to hear what they're really trying to tell you. Somebody comes to you and says, I want to put a button up here, bah. Listen between the lines. Why are they asking you to do that? Well, if you understand their history, they've worked at three different companies where they would go to the client and say, I'm trying to get this done. How would I do it? And the developer's going, I don't know. Just tell me what to do. I don't know, I'm not a designer. Or even worse, can I do this? No. We're in computers for Christ's sake. We really can't do this? Well, no, because we're engineers and we hear, can I do this particular thing? And you go down the narrow field and go, nope. We expand your field of vision. Oh, look, I can go around that really quickly and easily. Right? They've been told this for years. Have you told them this? Maybe not. Is it your fault? No. Do I care? No. Because you can work with it now. Understand why they're asking something, but don't assume she's there saying, put this button up here, and she's mean about it, then she's doing it because you know, she's just the meanest person ever, and she absolutely hates me. Maybe there's other things to it. Maybe they're very simple things. Maybe there's a very simple signal that you've sent. But please, assume the positive. Thank you. <laughs>